Welcome to Extension Connection. I'm your host, Jerry Buck. On today's show, we'll meet a Cooperative Extension Advisory Board member, chat with the Food for Health and Soul and Spanish version instructors, and we'll discuss Nevada Wildfire Awareness Week. My first guest, Christian Kohlberg, is a longtime advisor for the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension Advisory Committee. I've got to know, what brought you into the advisory committee? How did you get involved? Well, about 20 years ago, I was actually involved on the National 4-H Advisory Council. An opportunity through that, and then 4-H being one of the programs that Cooperative Extension was responsible for, gain more knowledge about Cooperative Extension. And when there was an advisory panel created, they asked that I come up and provide this Southern Nevada perspective uh, to the advisory panel and to the dean at the university, and so that's what we've had the opportunity to do. And you really can offer that Southern Nevada perspective. You've been here <laughs> all your life, haven't born, you, in born, the, in the born, Vegas Valley? Yep, born and raised. And a student of UNR, as I've been told. Yeah. Graduate of 1985, so. Way back then, you yeah, look younger. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Christian, is, yeah. is Cooperative Extension, um, with, with its reach from border to border in Nevada, we yeah. go from the most rural communities to, to frankly some of the most urban communities in the country, certainly yeah. in the western United States. Uh, how does an advisor help keep the College of Cooperative Extension focused on needs? It's a great question. Um, and I think specifically as we look to southern Nevada, essentially what I'm trying to do that we have in Las Vegas. What a lot of people aren't familiar with is a lot of the contacts that Cooperative Extension has now are more in an urban environment than they might be in a rural environment. And while we're still making quite an impact in the rural communities nationwide, and then as we look to Nevada throughout the 17 counties, a lot of the growth in our state, as you're very well aware, has happened in southern Nevada, in Las Vegas, in Henderson, and as we look to the north in Reno, and we go to those two areas. Right. So, so the outreach and the programs that we offer uh, are adapting and have uh, over the history of Cooperative Extension. When we started in 1914, we were looking at crop production. We were looking at agricultural improvements. Uh, as we grew into the Depression, we were looking at food production. As we go into the, the war era, we were looking at conservation, even back then as Cooperative Extension. And as we come in now into you know, 2011, as we look at the needs of communities, especially in the urban environment, those aren't the needs there. They're different for us. And so what Cooperative Extension does is take the resources of the university, the dean then provides those directives to each of the regions within the state, we then go out and we provide a variety of programs that you're very well aware of. Now there are, as you mentioned, regions. There's yes. three areas of Cooperative Extension, the, that rural zone of the central and northeast. It's those yep. 10 rural counties. Then the western area is, is Douglas County through Washoe County, Reno. Mm -hmm. And the southern area pretty much around the Las Vegas Valley through up through Caliente Correct. and Southern Nye County. You got it. Our programming does look much different from theirs. And some of that uh, direction we get from our advisory board. How many of you, can you describe the board a bit as to what it does, what its function is with UNCE? You betcha. As there are 17 counties throughout the state, the advisory board actually comes from each of those respective counties, bringing the unique perspective of each of those needs of those various communities to the dean. Uh, essentially then sharing input, we provide the feedback of what the community's needs might be in assessments, and then utilizing the university's dynamics come back into the respective counties and then offer programs in a variety of different areas. And of course, in each county we have very <coughs> different resources. Uh, in Clark County, mm -hmm. where there may be 130 or 40 employees who are all focused on developing and, and measuring impacts of programs, you might be in Eureka County where there's one extension educator oh, yeah. faculty member and, yep. and one person helping uh, with the 4-H program. Uh, just entirely different sets of resources yeah. to, to pull extension needs together. When we do needs assessments, and mm -hmm. we do in, in every county, many in this county, uh, when we do those needs assessments, do those come before advisory board members? Do you see what assessment conclusions have been drawn and offer 
uh, input to the dean about what sort of programs we might generate from those needs? Yeah, yeah without question, uh, we're asked for our feedback, which we then provide, but ultimately not to place any authoritarian issues to us as advisory. It's truly an advisory panel. The, the results and the final determinations fall to the regions, the area directors, and then back to the dean not only in terms of the needs assessments, the results of that, but then how we'll go implement those in the various counties throughout the state. You have a favorite program area? Oh, is there there's some lots part of, of it that, that, <laughs> uh, that gets you more excited than others? I, well, I think there's a variety of them, and, and, and there's so many that are available um, that are there, and I would always encourage all of our viewers to take a look and look to the website to see what's there. I, I think probably the area that we have the, the biggest impact, which is often comes as a surprise to people in Southern Nevada, is we get more calls as it relates to horticulture issues in Southern Nevada than even the rest of the state, which is more agricultural. True. But it deals primarily with issues with water conservation, desert landscaping. Uh, I've got a little uh, insect that's here eating my rose. What is it? They might call our Master Gardener program. We get 50,000 calls in a year, Jerry you know, with our master garden plan. There's about 150 a day where people are looking to determine, you know, how do I make this plant grow? What's, what's the issue that's related here? So I think master gardeners for, for me in Southern Nevada has always been a favorite, has been, will continue to be. There are other programs. I love the Chef for Kids program, a, a nutrition educational program that we do in conjunction with ACF. Uh, it's a program whereby we take a food and nutrition educational program into the second grade out into the Clark County School District in to schools that have needs assessments. Right. And we do food and nutrition education. The chefs have a whole program they've worked with in conjunction with Cooperative Extension. There's a teacher educational packet, it goes out. And then the end of a 12-week educational program, uh, the chefs come in and they prepare a healthy buffet for the kids to come through. So they actually get to apply, I love that. Uh, in the 4-H program, an adaptation from what you might normally perceive in a rural setting where you, you raise the cow, you take it to the county fair and you sell it, doesn't apply for us here except in some exceptions. I love a program within 4-H where they actually take a blind dog, uh, guide dog um, from the San Rafael School for the Blind. The 4-H members then bring that dog in, do all of the orientation with the dog in the community, get it familiar, and then they give the dog up to then be matched with a person who's visually impaired or blind. So that is, that is an incredible. Oh, <laughs> it really it's is. great, but it's it's not something you traditionally think of as being in 4H, but 4H goes over a variety of areas where we're trying to teach youth, you know, self-esteem and development and educational opportunities. So I was just great. Uh, reading a piece from um, from Walter Barker, the faculty member that that yep. leads the 4H program here in the county and and so much of their new science-based programming is is focused on helping kids to become critical thinkers mm -hmm. uh, not yep. just not just learn a hands-on skill but actually learn to think through a problem and come up with a solution on your own these kids are yeah. eight or nine years old yeah it, it's an incredible change in the way 4-h is approaching kids mm -hmm. you just sort of quickly went over chefs for kids yeah the last two years i've gone to a uh, fundraising mm -hmm. dinner for the chefs for kids and they have this incredible auctioneer that <laughs> works to works to bring as much money into uh, that program as the yep. audience is willing to give. Yeah. And, uh, and and truly, we thank you for that. No, you no do worries. a wonderful job at that program. Is that something you've done? I've seen you twice. Yeah. That's something you've been doing for a long time. It obviously goes uh, beyond giving advice. You're actually was, rolling up it, your sleeves yeah. and, and funding programs. It's, it's a gift from God, Jerry. I never planned nor intended to be a professional auctioneer that auctions charity benefits across the United States, but it's what it's turned out to be and a blessing with Cooperative Extension that, that within that one program I can lend my skills there as well. So quite nice, but I mean historically I was the marketing director at the Review Journal and so I bring a lot of that little knowledge that back view, in there yes. as well, along with the research that we did and understanding demographics and psychographics of the community and as well as being raised in a community when you know there are a hundred thousand of us you know and that's it i'm not i'm not one of the the real old timers i'm kind of a young timer if you meet the folks that were here and settled it it's a totally yes. different story of five thousand people I, I grew up in a community of a hundred thousand people and we're now and what a change yeah yeah we're now two million so 
Well, the night that I sat uh, and watched you last, yeah. my wife mentioned that I had a little something I'd been eating yeah. on my chin, and I went to take uh -huh. it off, and I bid on a, <laughs> on a dinner for 50. So I, I will admit Congratulations. you're quick. Congratulations. You're very, very quick. Congratulations, Jerry. Well, well, this has been a, an excellent conversation, and, and I want to thank you for your advisory skills and mm -hmm. your help and your caring for UNCE. Uh, we don't pay for this. We, yep. get, we know you do it out of a labor yep. of love, yep. and, uh, and we thank you for all of that. Uh, we're going to uh, close, and I thank you for interviewing with me today. And our next guest will be up after this. Welcome back to Extension Connection. I'm here with Ramona Woodard and Rosario Lopez to talk about the Food for Health and Soul program that also goes by the name Cocinando Delicioso y Saludable. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, and uh, obviously a program that is intended for English-speaking and Spanish-speaking audiences. Mm -hmm. That's correct. As I understand, this program is very focused on helping people learn how to eat more healthy, hopefully leads to living a bit longer, a healthier life, yes. without having to give up the foods that you grew up with, modifying foods we're familiar with to make them more healthy, is that the way this works? That's correct. It is an educational um, program, nutrition educational program, um, funded partly by Clark County, or UNCE Clark County, and the SNAP-Ed, USD SNAP-Ed. Now exactly what does SNAP-Ed mean? It's the Suppl Supplemental Nutrition Assistant Program, an educational program through the government and those funds are given to the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension to um, provide, provide our materials for the program. These are grant funds, I, I suspect, yes, and then we, we use those to build the program and take it out to the public. That's correct, the community. And so what, what is the program? How does, it, how does it work? Well, the program is designed to teach class participants how to modify their favorite family meals by reducing salt and sodium, uh, reducing fat and sugars, and prepare, uh, modify their food preparation for healthier eating practices to reduce chronic diseases such as hypertension, high blood pressure, um, diabetes, cancer, and um, things associate, associated with how we eat. And so when you go through the the, the program offerings, how do you, do you, do you do classes of actual food preparation or is this, do you teach them how to exchange what they've been using in their foods for what they should use in their foods? How, how does that work? Uh, first of all, we prepare the food in the kitchen lab and then after we explain to the participant at the class uh -huh. how they can modify the the favorites, you know, meals. Sure. Mm -hmm. And where is the where are the classes happening? Uh, wh where do people connect with with the Food for Health and Soul program? How do they connect? Um, yeah, where do they go? Is it in like a, uh, community buildings? Is it? We uh, are in churches. We are in uh, child development centers, school district, and senior complexes. Yeah. The recreation centers. Initially, Food for Health and Soul was um, created in a faith community. Um, there was a need, an assessment um, needs administrated, and the need for food modification was recognized in the African American community and Latino community. And so we started with the faith-based faith community, mm -hmm. and so then expanded out as our program grew grew and the need for more people to have this information was gathered. And I suspect you're gathering steam on more people wanting to participate. Uh, the program is probably growing. Um, do, you, do you know if the program's impacts, uh, if people are really changing what they're doing uh, as food preparers for their families? Yes, we do because we um, provide a pre-test, a post-test, and a post-post-test. And in those questionnaires or surveys, 
their research, the data is researched and provided back to us that people are following the methods that we're teaching in the community. And in both, both curriculums, there's six lessons. One that shares with participants how to re read their labels mm -hmm. and nutrition facts, um, salt and sodium, how to recognize where salt and, salt and sodium lies, the highest, um, introducing s spices and herbs back into their food preparation, adding more spices and herbs versus sodium and salt, and fat, recognizing fat, what fats are good fats and bad fats, and then of course eating more fibers in our diet, fruits and vegetables, lentils and beans, and things that will provide us good nutritional value without having the added salt and sodium and fats that are damaging to our bodies. It is very difficult to get excess sodium out of your diet. Isn't it? There's so much sodium that's a part of prepared foods that we buy. I, my, I just bought a can of spinach the other day. I couldn't believe it. There was more sodium than spinach yeah, in that thing. Yes. And you just have Mo to pay attention. Yeah, most of the, the packaged food or in, in cans food mm -hmm. have a lot of sodium on it. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and I suspect that's part of preservation to keep the, the food yes. safe, yeah. but at the same time, causes us some, some challenges. Mm -hmm. Yes, way too much sodium in processed foods. And so we share with our participants that if you come back to your traditional way of cooking, cooking fresh, um, that you can reduce sodium in your diet. You can prevent chronic diseases by modifying how you prepare your meals and reducing salt and sodium, mm -hmm. saturated fats, and eating more fiber. Mm -hmm. This is pretty well researched information, isn't it? That, that we, you're pretty certain that as we change to more healthy foods, the likelihood that we won't suffer from a chronic disease is pretty good, isn't it? It, it, it is helpful. It is. Well, yes, it is, because we have analyzed data as well. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned before, our pre-surveys um, and post and post-post surveys, which is given three months after our participants complete our program are showing 83 percent of our participants are changing have used um, more fiber in their diet reducing salt and sodium and are using the methods that food for health and soul and cocinando delicioso y saludable mm -hmm. provide to them in the community mm -hmm. okay. initially uh, a health assessment was administered in african americans first and then after we start with Latinos because we notice that Latinos we have the same problem. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I think most of us <laughs> yes, share in this problem, yeah. and and I really thank both of you for coming today to talk about this with us. And if you're one of the 83 percent who have changed behaviors, congratulations. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's going to be good for you and all of us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Extension Connection. Uh, our next subject is wildfire awareness and living with fire. And I'm here with Assistant Chief Michael Johnson and Sonia Sister, who is the Nevada Wildlife Awareness Week coordinator. Um, wildfire awareness. Everybody knows there's wildfires. Uh, what are we doing with our uh, effort in wildfire awareness? Well, um, the Living with Fire program, uh, our, our goal is to educate homeowners and the people living in these uh, wildland urban interface areas to become aware of what their responsibility is uh, d before and during a wildfire and to be prepared. What is the, what is the issue with wildfire uh, in Nevada? Is Nevada a, a wildfire prone state? Is, is this a problem state? Well, Jerry, yeah, I'd like to talk about a, that a little bit. Uh, Northern Nevada is typically, you know, targeted for the severe, you know, wildland fires and the threat yes. there. But we do have a threat here in Southern Nevada as well. Uh, and a lot of our rural areas, outlying areas, you know, when we think of Southern Nevada, we think of Las Vegas and the Strip. But those outlying areas, they have a wildland threat. And a lot of our communities are out there. 
what what are the areas that are there some that are more at risk than others uh, here in southern Nevada uh, where there's enough fuels I suppose for a fire oh absolutely and every area has a has its significant fuel type and fuel loading. For instance, you know, Mount Charleston, that's only 40 minutes away from the Las Vegas Valley, yes. has a fuel load similar to Lake Tahoe. Whereas out near the Warm Springs and Moapa area, where we had a significant fire last year, 500 acres, and there was an uh, urban interface, homes threatened, and even some homes lost there, had a much more lower deserty type fuel type. But once again, it was, it was at risk, and we did have those wildland fires there. Yes, that made a lot of news. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a big deal when it happens down here, and particularly when homes and, and families and property are in the way uh, of those fires. Um, what, is the, uh, what is the way that we approach the Awareness Week? How do we get the message out, and, and what is the message? Well, this year we have a very exciting campaign that's, um, that started April 30th um, at the launch of Wildfire Awareness Week, which was May 1st through the 8th. And our um, message is wildfire survival, it takes a community. And um, if uh, we've got our poster, which shows all the different people that make up this community, including uh, firefighters, wildland firefighters, uh, fuels reduction managers, uh, most importantly, the homeowners, builders, landscapers, they all have a role in keeping a community safe and helping them survive. Builders and landscapers. Absolutely. Now, theirs is probably a role that has to play out prior to uh, a fire. Oh yes, uh, actually everyone has a role prior to the fire in, in preparing that home. Um, the, the roofer would be uh, replacing a wood shake roof which is um, popular in these wildland urban interfaces. It's pretty. Very yes. pretty yes. but very very dangerous uh, and, and could easily catch fire from burning embers. And um, the landscaper, they're the ones that are, you know, when the homeowner's ready to change out their landscape or plant something new, the landscaper has to know what types of plants are better than others to plant in those um, areas right next to the home. And keeping some distances, I suspect, so that if a fire does come through, you don't have your landscape burning down your house. That's right. That's correct. <laughs> and that's actually uh, amazing to see some of the designs that are fireproofing properties and or at least reducing the risk and they can be very beautiful. It, oh, it, yeah. it doesn't mean that you have to look like a, a, a desert scape. It that's can right. be very pretty. So far, what are you guys doing uh, with, the, with the program, with the Awareness Week program? How are you getting that out? Uh, well, we have posters that are hanging up in all the rural uh, stations. And um, there are public service announcements on some of the network and um, local access channels. Mm -hmm. And uh, throughout the state, we have billboards uh, showing all these different people saying, you know, I have a role. And um, letting people know that there are many people that have to uh, take part in keeping a community safe. And uh, we also have a brand new publication, Fire Adapted Communities, the next step in wildfire preparedness. Uh, we, Cooperative Extension just published this and uh, it's for any community in Nevada, um, teaching all the roles that uh, the homeowner needs to take to keep their property safe and how to prepare for evacuation. That is a very dramatic cover. Uh, it, it basically says this is what could happen to you. Oh, yeah, and it, this, in this picture was one house catching the, the other and, and just tr transporting the fire across yeah. homes. You know, Mike, you had said uh, at the beginning of, our, of this segment that we think about the strip. We think about in, right in town. Um, what kind of, of fire protection uh, exists in the rural communities? Uh, are, there, are there the kind of resources in the rural communities that there are in town? You know, where you all gather up when the oh. wildfire happens. <laughs> yeah, when the call comes in, yeah, you know, everybody, everybody, uh, you know, comes out to, the responders come out to help suppress the wildland fires, every, you know, units from town as well. But to answer your first part of your question is what kind of responders or what kind of response would you expect in a rural community? It is uh, staffed, at least in Clark County, mostly by volunteer firefighters that staff uh, 13 yes. stations in the 13 communities in Clark County. And not to, not to exclude, of course, our cooperators and partners that are outside of that area that in Nye County, such as Pahrump Fire and, and even some of the other areas here and still in Southern Nevada, but not necessarily in Clark County. Sure. And uh, that's essentially your first line of, uh, you know, suppression for these type of wildland fires. And uh, they, they get training and, and the equipment and the, you know, apparatus necessary to uh, get out there and, and quick response is, is always, uh, always something that we hold 
paramount to uh, putting these things out before they get large and, and threatening homes. And I've always been amazed at the coordination that occurs among your organizations that don't work together every day, but when that emergency occurs, it is like clockwork out there to see Bureau of Land Management and, and Forest Service and local fire departments and volunteer groups and in, I guess in the rurals, even sometimes residents that are trained to assist in some capacity. Uh, it's an amazing thing to watch to see you guys manage a, an emergency. I, I think the uh, message this year as far as, you know, fire preparedness is t taking a community. It needs the community. And what we mean by community, like Sonia mentioned earlier, is that uh, we have our responders, the people that are residents, um, our cooperating agencies that also have, uh, you know, area such as the Forest Service and the BLM and a lot of the other federal agencies and state agencies as well. You bet. All right. Well, listen, thank you both very much for coming today and sharing the message with us. Uh, I hope you have found this uh, helpful and informational. And when you see these folks out sending their message, pay attention. This is important stuff. We'll see you next time.